Hello, David. Hello. Hello, Steve. Sorry, I'm a tad late. Just got rid of Good to have you here, Andrew. Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, are you ready to start, sir? Yes, yes. Right. right, I'll do the introduction and off we go. Uh, good evening, everyone, and it's lovely to see you all here this evening. Uh, oh, dear me. Is that... Nearly. No, I haven't said it yet, so you're all right. Nearly. <laughs> good evening, and uh, welcome to everyone that's on Zoom and also on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy tonight's uh, talk by David. But before that, I just have to uh, warn you, you know, that uh, we've got to keep a, uh, an eye out for, you know, the fire escapes and such like. Keep your eyes open, and if anything happens, just follow the, uh, follow the signs and the green lights. Uh, also, um, could you remember to switch your telephones off? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also, I'm sure, actually, if you wanted anything additional, you know, uh, paperwork or concerned with the, the talk, I'm sure David would oblige. <laughs> yes, and he's saying yes, good. So the only other thing is, you know, to uh, pass you across now to, uh, to Andrew, our president, and uh, he will keep us up to date on everything else. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much to David as well for agreeing to give this talk tonight. Uh, looks to be a very interesting topic indeed. Uh, just to go over the minutes of the last meeting, Steve, uh, it was on the 18th of January. We had uh, an excellent attendance um, for a uh, very topical and possibly contro possibly controversial talk by Les Turnbull on the uh, Wellington <laughs> Railway. Uh, I know it's generated a lot of interest uh, in the region and uh, has certainly set certain uh, Stevenson groups uh, alight with debate, so that's fantastic. Uh, and it's also been quite heavily viewed on, on uh, online already, so I think we're already up to 230 views actually, I'll, I'll just check it. Uh, several, several excellent questions, and again, thanks for, uh, to Steve for dealing with the, the end of the lecture as well. So if we can take that as a record of the meeting, Steve. Thank you. Uh, just uh, entries are about to close tomorrow for the local heat of our uh, the um, IMMM Young Persons Lecture Competition. Uh, so if anyone wants to enter, do please get in um, get in an entry. Uh, the details are on our website and uh, that of IMMM's website as well. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to running that next week. And of course, don't forget, um, our lectures for the rest of this year are sure just be prepared so we'll, we'll be announcing them shortly as will we be announcing the details of the annual dinner uh, which we're hoping to hold at the end of april so that should go out over the weekend um so but don't forget you can hear about all our events etc by following us online uh we do excellent lectures like the one you're you're at uh we've got a conference that we're currently organizing uh for for later on uh, in june and we'll also have a mini symposium before the annual dinner in april uh with a couple of people talking about small diameter tunnels and other geotechnical issues um and apart from that a load of excellent reason uh, other excellent regions reasons to join the institute uh, and the, of course the best way to keep up with everything is via membership where you uh, will also be sent one of our excellent newsletters uh, so to keep up to date with that so just go and look at moneyinstituteorguk slash membership and with that oh i've got the wrong slide there steve but uh with that i'll hand back to you steve uh, and uh, we can start hearing about the geological history of Saudi Arabia, and no doubt some excellent anecdotes as well. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, there is one other thing. Do you have any uh, apologies for absence? No, I, no. Haven't, I haven't got any apologies. Uh, could we make a note that I have uh, apologies from Malcolm Tilly and Les Turnbull? Sorry, whom? Brian Pickering. I'll put that on here. Right. Lovely. Right. Well, right. We've, um, we've been through that. So the, the minutes of the last meeting, uh, I think everyone's seen uh, what was happening there. Uh, so we do have anyone that would propose we accept that. Is there a hand going up somewhere? Very, very quietly. Thank you, John. Right. And a seconder. Oh, lots of them.
Excellent. Right, so uh, all we need to do now is just get on with the presentation. So uh, I've got a little introduction here. Um, for those of you who actually know David, uh, you know most of this already. But there will be people here who don't know him. And uh, he has an absolutely wonderful past and history regarding geology. Um, so we'll say he was awarded a, a BSc in geology uh, from Nottingham University in <coughs> 1962. Uh, followed by an MSc in Mineral Exploration at Imperial College London. Work has taken David to many places, Tanganyika, Australia, Papua New Guinea, East Antarctica, Libya, uh, Canada, Ir and Iran, and periods of teaching at Sunderland Polytechnic and the Open University, uh, followed by a position based in Jeddah with the Saudi Geological Survey as an administrative geologist, assisting the chief geologist in technical matters. In, uh, in 1980, he became the survey's senior geological editor, and in this role, he provided technical editing of geological maps and reports. David left the Middle East on retirement in 2003, is it that long ago? Uh, but continued to work part-time for Gulf Petrol Inc. until 2009. In addition, he completed the writing of The Geological Evolution of Saudi Arabia that was published by the Saudi Geological Survey in 2007, uh, in addition to the two major books that he's authored, co-authored. He has been, uh, had uh, geological maps and reports published by the Geological Survey of Tanganyika and the Australian Bureau of Mineral Resources. He's also a member of IMMM. So, you've been bored by me giving you all of that, so I'm not going to go any further, and all I can do now is uh, introduce you and hand over to David Granger, who will give you a talk on the geological ramble through Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good, good. Um, right, I've, well, first of all, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, members and guests, um, welcome to this talk, or should I say, uh, ah, sa uh, <coughs> Salam Aleikum, uh, which is uh, not very Arabic. Oh dear. Okay. Um, I've entitled this uh, A Geological Ramble Through Saudi Arabia deliberately, as it'll be sort of a gentle stroll. Um, through the geology of Saudi Arabia rather than a, a comprehensive academic uh, lecture. Uh, and I hope you find it interesting, an interesting uh, insight really into this fascinating country that uh, few Westerners know uh, outside the stereotypical cliches uh, of the country. Um, so let's, um, I'm going to, um, you know, discredit, shall we say, some of the popular myths that suggest that Saudi Arabia is nothing more than a, um, sand dunes uh, and camels uh, and oil wells. Um, the reality is quite different. Um, I'll dispel these before concentrating a bit on the geology. Uh, but first of all, we need a few facts. Okay, this is uh, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia. Um, you can see the geographic location um, here in green, which is the, the green, of the, the country of Saudi Arabia, shall we, because that flag is green, um, being an, an Islamic country. Um, you can see where, it, la where it, it, it is part of the Arabian Peninsula, and here you can see it in terms of its size in relation to parts of Western Europe. Uh, it's seven times the size of the British Isles, a uh, quarter the size of the USA. Um, a total of 2.15 million square kilometers. So it's quite a large country. Um, it's got a population of 37 million. Um, and uh, one of its major attributes is that the birthplace of, of Islam. Um, here, Mecca is the holy city of Islam, uh, not far from Jeddah, 
which is where R is based, where the geological survey is based. And here we have Riyadh, which is the capital. Um, it's an absolute monarchy. Uh, the present king is King Salman, but the de facto ruler is the crown prince, um, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Um, the country was founded, if that's the way to put it, in 1932, when King Abdulaziz bin Saud um, finished sort of the conquering of um, what is now Saudi Arabia, he, shall we say, united all the tribes under his leadership um, by um, a practice of uh, warfare and also judicious marriages um, into the various clans and tribes. Uh, so this is 1932. It's totally different to what it is now because there's no oil. So it's a very poor country. Um, but it's interesting because the, the family name, uh, Saud, uh, was given to the country, or well, he gave it to the country, so it's now Saudi Arabia. Um, I say absolute monarchy. Right. Uh, as you can see here, it's uh, bounded by the Red Sea, which is deep and narrow, um, and the Arabian Gulf, which is very shallow. Uh, and of course, you have all the, the various countries round, round about. It occupies about 80% of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Now, it's not just deserts, uh, as, I'll, as I'll show you. But let me, let me just go a bit further and try and dispel some of the, the myths that people might have. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not just a land of sand dunes, oil wells, and camels. Um, by the way, those, those sand dunes are 250 meters high. That's part of the empty quarter, the uh, Rubo Khali. Um, this is a very snooty looking camel. And of course, oil wells. But it's not all that. It's a land of mountains as well. Those mountains there, Part, the, up to 2,000 two meters here, the called the Harithi Mountains, inland from, from Jeddah, forming part of the Red Sea Escarpment. We'll talk about that later. And then you have mountains like this. This is a place called Jabal, Jabal Ibrahim. Uh, and these, it's granite, these are huge boulders here. You can tell the scale. That's my wife there and my daughter. Um, so it, it's, it, 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 you know, it's not just, uh, but yeah, you do have plains here. It just Now this is stereotypical desert actually. Uh, all desert, not just sand dunes. This is the interior of Saudi Arabia, what's called the Nej, which is the heartland of Saudi Arabia, where um, near Riyadh, which is where uh, Abdulaziz uh, w was based when he started uniting the tribes of Saudi Arabia, and fantastic coral reefs, some of the best coral reefs in the world. Um, certainly were there uh, when I was there 20 odd years ago. Um, whoops, wrong one. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's me um, when I was much younger. <laughs> um, it was a fantastic place for a lent scuba dive there. Uh, the coral reefs actually well, they're pristine because there's no tourism. Um, so, and very little pollution, except concentrated around some of the major towns. But uh, I honestly don't know what it's like now. The big problem, as you may know, with coral reefs is the uh, bleaching because of the rise in, in temperature of the seawater. Uh, big problem. <coughs> Escarpments uh, and mountains. Escarpments, this is the uh, top one is the Tuwaik Escarpment. It's called the backbone of Saudi Arabia. It's uh, inland near, near Riyadh. Um, it's about a thousand meters, sorry, a thousand kilometers long. Um, big arc. Uh, and, and there it's up to 200 meters high. Uh, and then here, the, the lower picture is Al Habla. This is down in the southwest. And that cliff there is roughly 120, 150 to 200 meters uh, vertical. 
Um, and you make out here the greenery. All right? That's because it was, it was a spring line. Uh, rainfall does, oh, it's actually quite wet in that area, and the water percolates down through the sandstone and then hits the uh, impermeable rocks beneath, the very old uh, Precambrian rocks, and you get the springs. And there's a village there. It's colloquially known as the Hanging Village because literally almost hanging on the side of the mountain. Um, it's abandoned now, but it was uh, inhabited. And the inhabitants used to climb up in a series of ladders and gullies and steps cut into the rock. Um, they lived there to uh, escape the, um, the Ottoman Turks who occupied this area uh, up to the First World War. Sorry, let's just go back a minute. Yeah, the, the highest point in Saudi Arabia is very close to this, uh, Jabal Sauda, just over 3,000 meters. Totally different climate down there to the rest of Saudi Arabia. It's, it's very pleasant. Uh, volcanoes. <coughs> this is a much younger me sitting on top of the, uh, the mountain there. Um, I'll, I'll come on to these, to these uh, uh, volcanoes later. They're, they're not quite unique in the world, but they're very rare. Um, the, con the contrast here, a different type of lava. Uh, so volcanoes, and it's not just deserts and sandstorms. This sandstorm is just outside uh, Jeddah. When you get caught in a sandstorm, it's quite interesting because you get the paint you know, um, worn off the front of your car. Um, and the headlights get all frosted. Um, but it's also, you get rain. Uh, this uh, on the, the, the main picture is uh, a rainstorm on, on the way to Riyadh. Uh, it's interesting that uh, more people die in desert floods than do of heat stroke. Um, and, uh, you may remember, um, in September 2023, uh, 11,000 people died in a flash flood which engulfed or destroyed much of the town of Derna on the coast of Libya. It was, well, there were very heavy rainstorms inland uh, in the Wadi, which is normally dry, and uh, two dams broke, and the rush of water sort of destroyed very much of the, uh, a lot of the, the town, and 11,000 people died. And that was that's in the desert. Um, and this one here, this is a flash flood, not particularly um, dangerous. Again, my wife there. Um, we, we'd been up into the mountains, and it, it started spotting rain, so it's okay, we'll, we'll drive down through the mountains back towards Jeddah, and we stopped by the side of this wadi, and suddenly this water flowed down. It's only about you know, less than half a meter deep, but it suddenly appeared. It wasn't raining there, but it had been raining up in the hills, maybe 10, 20 kilometers away. And that water, and you can get caught very easily uh, if you're not careful. And it's snow. It actually snows in Saudi Arabia. This up in the north of Saudi. Um, that was quite a substantial snowfall. Maybe, I don't know, five or six um, uh, centimeters of, of snow. Um, I don't think uh, that guy there was really equipped for the weather, but never mind. Um, and I've actually seen pictures of people skiing on, the sand, on, on snow on the sand dunes. Um, but uh, it, it, it does happen. Because if, if you think about it, we're not far from Palestine. And going back to the Bible, you know, the, um, at the time of, uh, of, uh, of Jesus being born, uh, the, um, the shepherds are out in the fields. It's bloody cold. <laughs> and uh, you get snow there, a lot of snow in, in, uh, in, in, in the Middle East, in that part of the Middle East. 
and this part of Saudi Arabia does get snow. But you get uh, areas of luxuriant vegetation. Um, Alula is in the north of Saudi Arabia. It's actually uh, Dedan is mentioned in the Old Testament. And this is a, a very typical oasis in this part of Saudi Arabia. Again, um, the, it, it rarely rains, um, but the, the water is actually fossil water, which may be 20,000 years old, that's percolated down through the sandstones, and then comes out of the springs, and they form this oasis here of date palms. Here you've got typical date palms, here are your dates. And they often have you know, understory of, uh, of vegetables as well. This will be uh, irrigated, of course, from the, the springs that come out at the, the bottom of the sandstone here. <clears throat> okay, so a few myths have gone, I hope, but now I'll get down to a bit of the uh, geology. So the rocks of Saudi Arabia, they're old. Um, as much as 2,000 um, million years old, 2 billion years old. Um, there have been acid, massive earth movements. Uh, the rocks have been uh, contorted and, and uh, folded. Um, ancient climates, because of the, the movement of what is now Saudi Arabia, uh, through continental drift and movement, um, they've gone through different climatic regimes. So you've got deserts you know, fossil deserts, you know, coral reefs, um, tropical swamps, and uh, ice sheets that have affected the, the land. And the, the rocks contain, as you well know, enormous quote reserves of oil and gas, and also gold. And Saudi Arabia is possibly the location of King Solomon's mine. I'll get onto that later. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll look at some of the geology now. Uh, and here it is, Saudi Arabia in relation to uh, plate tectonic activity. Uh, you can see, whoops, sorry, go back a minute. Um, here's Saudi Arabia, obviously, are getting green. <coughs> and this shows the Earth's tectonic plates. As you know, the Earth's crust is made up of a series of plates which are con constantly moving relative to one another. Um, the seven major plates, uh, for example, you've got the Pacific plate, the South American plate, the African plate, etc., etc., and a number of others, uh, minor plates, of which the Arabian plate I I is one. <coughs> it's interesting that um, you know, people know about, at least have an inkling of what plate uh, tectonics is, but um, when I was at university, it wasn't taught because the theory of plate, plate tectonics hadn't been developed at that time. You heard about, we, at the uni, about continental drift, the, the, the movement of, uh, and the way that Africa uh, sort of meshes in, if you like, to South America, but there wasn't really a mechanism as how it actually worked. And it wasn't until I left university and was uh, uh, actually teaching eventually in, in the 70s at uh, uh, Sunderland Polytechnic, which is now the university, and uh, I had to learn about plate tectonics. I, mean, I, I was sort of one lecture ahead of the student, shall we say, at the time. But uh, anyway, um, it's you know self <laughs> self evident isn't the right term, but it's it, it's well documented now that it, it, it works and it does occur. So this is the plate tectonic relationship of, of Saudi Arabia. <coughs> and here's the, Arab well, the Arabian plate. All right, we'll go into the, 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 the parts of it later. But this is the plate tectonic relationship. So you've got the, here you've got the Eurasian plate, the African plate here, and this is the Turkish microplate, part of the Eurasian plate. And you've got the Indian plate down here. And they're all in movement. But the main thing is that the Arabian plate is moving northwards. Right? 
and it's actually splitting away from Africa, and hence the Red Sea, actually splitting apart, and a new ocean is forming here in the Red Sea, what, what is now the Red Sea. Again, we'll come on to this later. But it's pushing into the Eurasian plate here, and it's moving against the African plate along what's known as the Dead Sea Transform Fault here, and then the East Anatolian Fault here. Okay? And these arrows show the relative movement. So the uh, Arabian plate is moving north relative to the, excuse me, the African plate there. Uh, <coughs> the movement is about the, the rate at which your fingernails grow. One to two centimeters a year in terms of, uh, of here, okay? Um, the result of this movement is a lot of seismic activity along these lines here, okay? <coughs> Let me just move on to these. <coughs> Yeah, while I was in Saudi Arabia, um, the Red Sea widened by about one meter. So it's, it's active, it's moving all the time. <coughs> now, I say they move relatively slowly, one to two um, millimeters a year, um, sorry, centimeters a year, but that's not always been the case. Let me, go, let me just go back a minute here. Um, here's India, okay? That actually was for about uh, 70 million years moved at the rate of 20 centimeters a year northwards into Eurasia. And the result of that, of course, is the Himalayas. The act, you, you can think of this like a, a bulldozer you know, encroaching onto Eurasian plate and pushing up and forming the, the Himalayas. <clears throat> well, how do we know, let me just go back, how do we know um, these plate tectonic relationships? What's the proof? Well, here is the seismicity of the Middle East. And what it does is define the Arabian plate here all the earthquakes, these red dots are the earthquakes. And you see the earthquakes along the Dead Sea Fault here, the East Anatolian Fault, and the Zagros Suture here. Right? And it's interesting, if you look here, this is the Musandam Peninsula of Oman and uh, the United Arab Emirates, and it, it, you can almost see it pushing into Iran, right? It's actually pushing its way into Iran. And the, this is the Strait of Hormuz, right? <coughs> it's, Sorry, I, I should have mentioned this also, but here is a choke point at the southern end of the Red Sea. And that's the Strait, the uh, Bab el Mandeb, which is uh, in the news at the moment. Um, in Arabic, it's called the Gateway of Tears uh, because of the ships being wrecked in there. It's only, at the, the narrowest point, is, it's only about 29 kilometers wide. And that, of course, is a choke point where the Houthi rebels are attacking uh, shipping. Anyway, back to uh, seismicity. Um, <laughs> Does anyone have a holiday home in, in Turkey? Uh, not a good place. The whole of this part of Turkey, uh, Western Turkey, is very actively seismic. Here is the East Anatolian Fault. Uh, and that, I've, meant, I've shown the location of the earthquakes in February uh, 2023 
almost a, well, just over a year ago. It was on the 6th of uh, February, 2023, where they had those devastating earthquakes in uh, uh, Turkey and Syria. Um, <clears throat> 7.8 uh, on the magnitude scale, uh, which is very, a very strong earthquake, right? And 11,000 people, sorry, 25,000 people at least, sorry, am I getting this wrong? I, I keep remembering more than that, wasn't it? Excuse me a moment. Let me get the, the numbers right. No, sorry, I lost it. Uh, sorry, 50, yeah, I got it. 55,000 people died in the earthquake in um, Syria and Turkey, most, most of them in Turkey. Um, it was totally devastating. But it's interesting that uh, in 1995, there was an earthquake here in, in the Gulf of Aqaba. Right? Um, and only nine, it was 7.4 on the Richter scale, whereas this one was uh, 7.8. Um, and only nine people died. And of course, the reason was that this area here is almost totally uninhabited, whereas these were cities and towns. Um, that's always the, the problem with, earth <laughs> with earthquakes. Uh, the damage, not necessarily because of the magnitude of the earthquake, is whether it occurs uh, at a shallow depth or a, a very deep depth, or in areas of uh, habitation. I th if I recall rightly, the, the strongest earthquake recorded is about over eight on the scale, and that was in Alaska. I can't remember the date. Uh, totally uninhabited area, and no one died. Right. Um, another th thing about earthquakes, the, the magnitude scale, is that it's log logarithmic. Okay, so a seven earthquake is ten times the magnitude of a six earthquake. So it goes up log logarithmically. I never get that out very easily. Um, so that, that's something about the um, seismicity. And the seismicity defines the plates. And this is worldwide. All the plates are defined by earthquakes and uh, volcanic activity, etc. <coughs> OK, geology at last, shall we say. This is a, a um, geologic map of the Arabian Peninsula. And what, we, what do we have? There's three major um, parts, if you like, to the um, uh, geology of the Arabian Peninsula. You've got the old rocks, the Arabian Shield, which is in, in a gray color here. Then you've got the rocks of the Arabian platform, which are younger. And these are all these colored units around here, going back to the Arabian Shield, it's anything older than about 540 million years. Right? And so the uh, platform rocks are younger than 540 million years. Um, and in Saudi Arabia, they get younger as we go this way. Right? And then the third unit, uh, well, you can lumped together the Red Sea and the opening of the Red Sea and these sort of reddish areas here, which are lava fields, are known as harats in, in Arabic. Um, very, very interesting. And, and they cover about 180,000 square kilometers in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, fascinating uh, uh, geology. So those are the three major uh, parts to the, um, the geology of, of Saudi Arabia. Now, just to mention, I'll come back to this later, but um, volcanic activity has been going on in Saudi Arabia, a recent one, for about the last 20 million years. Uh, but the, late, the, the latest activity, latest volcano eruption was here, just near Medina, which is the second most holy city in Islam, um, in 1256 AD, or 
we shouldn't use AD these days, which you use CE, which is common era, right? You may have heard of it, but uh, the old AD is now CE, and BC is BCE, which is before common era. Um, the, the cutoff point is still, you know, year one, if you like, in, in, the, in the Christian calendar, but it gets away with the um, Christian connotation of BC and AD. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. People still use both, but that's the way it's done. Okay, in 1256, they had an eruption here, and it lasted about three months, um, and almost got to the um, walls of old Medina, but stopped. If you, if you think about it, or if you've seen the pictures of the latest um, eruptions in, in uh, Iceland, fissure eruptions, you have, you have, uh, a fault in the, in the Earth's surface, and the lava wells out, not just, not just huge uh, volcanic eruptions, you know, 20,000 meters up into the, uh, into the sky. Um, it well, just wells out as, as fluid lava flows. That's what happened um, in 1256. Um, there was another uh, volcano, volcanic eruption down here in the Straits of, uh, in the Bab el Mandab. And that was uh, not, let me get the night, uh, 2007. There was an island, there's an island down here, uh, Yemen island, called um, Jabal al-Tayir. And uh, the eruption there, and unfortunately, um, about, I can't remember exactly how many, about a dozen uh, Yemeni soldiers were, were killed during the eruption. There's another anecdote, there's anecdotal evidence of another volcano erupting in here, and again, we'll see it later, uh, about 200 years ago. <coughs> so it's, very, it's still volcanically active. <coughs> Okay, this is a schematic cross-section through the Arabian Peninsula from southwest to northeast. Um, exaggerated, of course, in terms of the um, uh, altitude. But you, you, you can see the, uh, the main features of, of the geology. You've got the Arabian Shield here, the old rocks. Um, the Red Sea Escarpment here, now that's formed by, uh, as the Red Sea opened, you get deep faults in the Earth's crust as, as the, um, the Red Sea opened, and also uplift uh, because of the upwelling of lava, um, magma from deep down in, in the crust, and this pushed up the, to form the Red Sea escarpment, which dips away towards the Arabian Gulf here. And these are the younger rocks of the Arabian platform, as a uh, post 540 million years. <clears throat> so that's, that's just a, a cross-section, uh, a very schematic one, showing you the, um, the, the, the layout of the geology. I'm going to take my watch off, see if I can get the time okay. <clears throat> right. The Arabian Shield. So that's the, the area here. The ancient core of Arabia, much as two billion years old. Metamorphosed rocks are very altered, um, volcanic and sedimentary rocks altered through heat and pressure by deep burial and contortions within the Earth's crust, intruded by granites, folded and faulted. The only fossils are algae in the younger Precambrian rocks, rich in minerals, especially gold and copper. Okay, now there's a few shots of the Arabian shield rocks. Here, these are old metamorphosed volcanic and sedimentary rocks intruded by a granite intrusion here, okay? So later, and then here you have, and you, see, you can see almost se uh, semi-vertically uh, aligned uh, ancient rocks here, very steeply dipping. This is interesting because this building here is what's euphemously known as a station on the Hijaz Railway. And some people may have heard of that. It was a railway line built from Damascus to Medina in the beginning, in the early years of the 20th century uh, to transport pilgrims 
basically from uh, Damascus to Medina and then on to, to, Jeddah, uh, to uh, Mecca. Uh, it gained prominence because this is the railway line that Lawrence Arabia blew up during the First World War. And these so-called stations were actually little forts, blockhouses, uh, which occupied by the Turkish garrison uh, when they were trying to protect the, the railway. That's an, that's a, a, I could do a lecture on that or a talk on that uh, at Infiditum. Fascinating, the Hijaz Railway. So the rocks are folded and faulted. Here you can see the, the way these rocks have been overturned, you know, squeezed by earth movements deep in the Earth's crust. And here you have a, a fault here. Now, I don't think, let's see here, the rocks have been bent down there by this side of the fault dragging down. All right? So that's a quite a nice little example of, of faulting. Uh, granites, all right? Th these help to form the, the bedrock, the the core of uh, the Arabian shield. Now this here on the top is an example of a copy, which is a, a Dutch stroke Afrikaans word for uh, great outcrops usually um, in southern Africa, but it's been, the, the name has been transferred to uh, all over the, the country. You can think of them as the equivalent of tours in, on, in, in southwest England, on the great tours of southwest England. Uh, and the lower picture is what's known as an Inselberg, uh, a German term, island mountain. And of course, the Germans occupied what is now Namibia, uh, pre-First World War, uh, German southwest Africa, and they named these type of mountains, whoops, sorry, as um, um, Inselberg, island mountains. Granite, so here you've actually got lots standing water I uh, get a heavy rain in November 1997, and actually my wife and I were camping here. And uh, luckily, we, we uh, uh, up on the side of the, of the hill, and we had torrential rain, um, but we were okay. <laughs> but it, it, it flooded down on, on the plain beneath. Now these pre cambrian rocks, all, they do contain fossils. The, the younger ones, um, algae. And this is a, a metamorphosed limestone called, uh, in, in a place called Wadi Fatima, just inland from, from Jeddah. And these rocks are about 690 million years old. Um, but here, these are what are silicified stromatolites, all right? uh, which are algae. And I'll show you some more pictures. But that, that's a, a very young me, or a younger me. Um, but the, these rocks, you see how they're folded. They're, they're twisted and folded. But they're only very weakly metamorphosed. Now, stromatolites, they, they're, they've lasted for sort of 100,000, sorry, 1,000 million years, unchanged. So they're, they're very successful in one way, but they never got any further. Uh, just algae, uh, and these are present-day stromatolites in Shark Bay in Western Australia. Um, well, the mounds of al the algae uh, trap sand and sediment and slowly build up to these, uh, it, these just the, the very shallow water. And it's very salty there, so there's very little living in there which would actually eat the algae. So that's why they're preserved. And I don't know if you can see here, but these are bubbles of oxygen being given off by the, by the algae. And that's, back in the Precambrian, that's the way that the Earth's atmosphere developed its oxygen. Um, and when the oxygen level got to about 10% of what it is today, then you had what's known as the uh, explosion of life. You, you change from algae to shelly fossils, or fossils that you can recognize today. Um, 
not just uh, Shelley fossil, but um, jellyfish, etc., etc., in the late Precambrian. Now, that's interesting. It's, the, the, it's still happening today. But we've seen pictures, uh, uh, examples of, of the very contorted uh, rocks of the Arabian Shield, but not all of them are like that. The, the, these are almost horizontal, very weakly metamorphosed, uh, late uh, Precambrian rocks. Let's go back, here's the geology again, we're going back to the Arabian platform now, these rocks here. They're less than 400, 540 million years old, lots of shelly fossils, it wraps around the Arabian Shield, and um, I got thickened eastwards there. I should be thin eastwards into the Arabian Shield. Uh, evidence of chi changing climates and lots of oil and gas reserves. A feature about the, 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 this time is the way that Arabia has wandered um, as a result of continental drift and, and plate tectonic activity. And you can see the way that it's, it's, it's gone down. Here you see? Here's the equator. So south of the equator, and it actually went to the South Pole at the time. Two lots of glaciation, then came back again to its present position. Well, not quite. It's actually gone further than that now, but you can see the, the trend. Um, how do we know? What's known as remnant mag magnetism. Uh, lots of rocks contain, sedimentary rocks contain magnetite. And when the rocks are formed, they take on the magnetism of the latitude in which they are laid down. And uh, the paleomagnetism can be determined, um, and you can then work out the paleo latitude of the, the rocks at that time. I won't go into this, it's just the, 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 all the different units of the, of the, you know. Okay, this line here, very good line, is what's known as unconformity, okay? So the rocks below there, the rocks of the Arabian Shield, and these rocks here are sandstones, um, 500 million year old sandstones. And this line here represents probably hundreds of millions of years uh, of erosion. These rocks here are, has anyone been to Petra in, in Jordan? Okay. Uh, Petra is, was um, the capital city, if you like, of the Nambatean um, civilization uh, from about 100 um, BCE to 100, uh, sorry, BCE, yes, to 100 uh, CE. Um, when the Romans took it over. Um, but in northern Saudi Arabia, a place called Medan Saleh is an outpost or another you know, city of the Nabataeans. And this is, if you see this scale here, the people, that's called Khazra Farad. And this is just the facade here, and the tomb inside is half the size of this room. Right? And these are all various tombs here the Nabataean civilization, fantastic builders. Uh, it, it, it's an incredible place. Huh. This is due to uh, wind erosion, which has undercut this block of sandstone. And of course, eventually, that pedestal will be eroded away and it'll fall down. So that's the power of the wind. These are some fossils from these sandstones. Um, this is not, it's a trilobite. It's like a, a lot, very large woodlouse, if you like. And as it crawled around the sea floor, it produced these trails you know, with its legs going like this. And then you get worm trails as well. But no, no shelly fossils. Fossil groundwater in these ancient sandstones. We, we've seen this one before. But this is pivot irrigation in the north of Saudi Arabia, where they put wells down about 1,000 meters to tap into the fossil groundwater. And of course, they, they're using it up at an incredibly rate. Now, 
you sh I showed you where the, um, the, 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 the wandering continents or wandering um, uh, plate, we had two, two, two glaciations in a late Ordovician about 400, 400 million years ago and much later in the Carboniferous. <coughs> and we had glaciers. This is um, a glacial valley. Right. So th this is the infill that was left behind by the retreating glacier. Right. And here, this, uh, this is from uh, uh, Antarctica. This is a modern analog, what it, would, what it would have liked 450 million years ago. These are glacial drop stones and striations. This is the, from the, uh, this is a fossil one here. Now this one is um, from Antarctica. These are actually fossil drop stones in Antarctica. And these are uh, striations made by the glacier as it screwed across the, the, the rock. Later you got the Tethys Ocean in which you had all these, whoops, where am I? All these rocks uh, develop, dipping towards the, the Red Sea. Right? And they were deposited in this Tethys Ocean here as Gondwana, which was a, a large continental mass, um, broke up and dispersed. This is Laurasia and uh, Gondwana and what's on the Tethys Ocean here. So all these rocks were laid down in the Tethys Ocean. Right, what's happened? What's happened? Yeah, fine. Yes, thank you. So let's have a look at some of these rocks that were laid down in this Tethys Ocean. <clears throat> this is the Tuake Mountain Limestone. Um, this is the Tuake Escarpment, um, about 150 kilometers um, southwest of Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. Um, it, it's a fantastic uh, escarpment, and here you've got, um, why won't it, sorry, here we are. Um, this is a, a, a butte, if you, uh, you know, cowboy films in the Wild West, this is typical, you know, cowboy uh, scenery, except it's in Saudi Arabia. And there's some of the fossils you find in this. Uh, ammonites, here are corals, uh, gastropods. It is a fantastic place. And these are some of the, the, the fossils. Right? Uh, crinoids. Um, that looks like uh, as if it's a plant. Actually, it's an animal uh, attached to the seabed. It's a bit like a coral, if you like, but uh, different. But it has the same um, wavy uh, arms uh, to catch prey. Uh, and these are the, with the broken bits of the, of the stem you often find in. You find these in the, in the, in the Pennines, same, same age. or well, not the same age, but the, the same type of, of fossils. Uh, Tuake Mountain Limestone, F fantastic place. Uh, this is the, uh, the escarpment of, of those limestones on the, on the, on the, the, um, the highway from Jeddah to, to Riyadh, which Riyadh being the capital. Um, these rocks are about 175 to 160 million years old um, and about uh, 150, 200 meters high there. It's, it's a fantastic escarpment which stretches um, 
probably a thousand kilometers in, in length. Um, gradually decreasing in elevation down into the uh, empty quarter of the southwest. I, I won't go into this, but the, these are the later rocks, um, which here's, here's Riyadh, which is the capital, right? And these are the, those limestones um, I showed you. And then gradually getting younger, 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 down to the, the Gulf, all right? So these are much younger rocks, but I won't go into that. There's uh, another, <laughs> another talk. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, going back to the other side of the country, to the Red Sea Rift. It's a very it's a fascinating area. And uh, here, oops, sorry. The Red Sea and the, the Rift Valleys in East Africa, and this is the Gulf of Aden. Right? And this is what's known as a triple junction here, which is typical of, uh, of these uh, movements. So Arabia is moving that way, and then you've got Africa moving this way, and it's splitting apart. So it's splitting here, and this part will eventually move off to there, and maybe you'll get another ocean forming here as Africa uh, splits apart. All right, so here we are. This is the, the Red Sea. It started opening about 30 million years ago. Um, so uh, Arabia is moving that way relative to Africa at about um, you know, two centimeters uh, a year. <coughs> the red, whoops, sorry, go back, didn't mean that. <clears throat> the red and, and, and uh, pink are what in Saudi Arabia is known as the harats, which are the lava, lava fields. They stretch all the way from Syria down through Saudi Arabia into Yemen, and then similar ones in uh, Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea here. So the, the Red Sea is opening... <coughs> is splitting apart, and it's about um, uh, 1,900 uh, kilometers long, and uh, what is it, 250 uh, kilometers wide, and over 2,000 meters deep. <coughs> right, so as a result of this Earth movement with the uh, Red Sea opening up, um, because of um, a lava plume coming up from beneath, a bit like, if you think of Iceland at the moment, where um, you've got vo volcanism at the surface and the, the plates are moving apart, hence the um, uh, Iceland is similar to that. <clears throat> and you've got the uh, lava outpourings along the, what it, uh, uh, along the, uh, um, inland from what is now the Red Sea. The latest erupt, the last eruption in Saudi Arabia was in 1256. Right? Uh, very close to Medina, which is the second most holy city in Islam. Um, and the lava got to within a few kilometers of the, the walls of Medina. It lasted for about three months, um, and great outpourings of lava. <coughs> Why aren't I moving? Oops, sorry, back again. Sorry, back again. Right, okay. Now, yes. Right. This is uh, just to show some of those lava flows. This is our campsite at the time um, beneath the lava flow, as you can see here, of Harad Raha in the north of Saudi Arabia. Uh, that is several hundred meters thick, individual lava flows, and between them, you often find soil horizons. 
which means the, the, you know, the, the lava flow stopped, then you've got vegetation and soil on top, and another lava flow. So it's layer cake. This is a lava field near, near, near Jeddah, flat lying here. Here's a good example. You see the, the red here? This is the uh, soil, uh, soil horizon. One lava flow, the soil formed, another lava flow, and you get this layer cake one on top of the other. Fascinating. This is called, called Wabba Crater on one of the uh, Haraps, the lava flows. Uh, it's about the, if I can finally get the pointer again. That's about two kilometers across. All right. uh, it forms a slight dome. And we, uh, we, the first time we went, we just drove across the desert here, and there's very little sign of it until you right on the edge. And then it's about 200 meter drop. And here was a, there was a salt lake in the middle at the time. Um, this is it here. You see the lava flow, the lava flows on top here. And then these are the Precambrian rocks, very old rocks. And you've got a salt lake in the middle there, which dries out periodically. <clears throat> this was um, an explosion, explosion crater. Um, the lava came close to the surface, reacted with groundwater, and you had a huge uh, explosion. If we go back, you can see the roundabout here. You can see this is all the explosion material thrown at the volcano. And a later eruption has flowed around it and impinged on it this slightly, slightly higher area here. Fantastic location. These are lava bombs, which are uh, lava which is spewed out from the volcano and form these spindle-shaped bombs, called the bombs. I mean, you wouldn't want to be around when one of those landed on you. Uh, this is our campsite here. Um, this is the recent, more recent lava flow here. I'll show you these, these are what are called the white volcanoes. Um, that, here's the main road, north-south main road. Uh, Medina is down here. Um, that's about 60 kilometers. It took us two days to get across there. The track was awful. But you've got these three volcanoes, or two of them in particular, these white ones. And they're called the white volcanoes. Jabal Beda is over 2,000 meters high, and Jabal Abiyad is under 2,000 meters. This is this is called Harat Kish. Harat just means lava, uh, lava field. So this is a, a picture of this. These are the two volcanoes, Jabal Beda and Jabal Abiyad. In the 1950s, there was a, a survey of, of world volcanoes. And these were, uh, were a glimpse from a distance, and they were thought to be covered in snow because of the color. All right? But no, they're not. The color doesn't show up so well in this. But this is the interior of Jabal Beda, um, which is a huge amphitheater, if you like. Uh, and these here are more recent um, eruptions later. And here at the back here is Jabal Beda, which is another one. Um, that is about, you know, it's near two, near 2,000 meters high, that one. This is Jabal Beda. Showing more, more of a, a light color. They're the same rocks, but this came out as a sticky lava and just came up, uh, whereas the other one exploded to form that sort of donut shape. It's an absolutely incredible area. Okay, this is me. Okay, this is sitting on top of uh, a, a Jabal Abiyad which is the sticky one, shall we say, that, that formed like the dome. 
And this is double uh, beta, which is uh, like a donut here, okay? And that's, uh, that's another one in the background, okay? Um, so th this here is, is a, a, a more recent lava, which is a totally different composition. This is basalt here. So the contrast is incredible. Uh, this is, uh, we're on the top of uh, Jabal Abiyad here. So it's uh, just around 2,000 meters high. And these jellyfish type uh, lava domes, it's an incredible area, absolutely incredible. Okay, and this is, this is uh, Jabal Beda, in a, sorry, Jabal uh, Kida in the background here which is, they, they call it the Mount Fuji of Saudi Arabia. Um, very fluid lava flow, which have flowed here. These have flowed from there, and these are called uh, Hawaiian terms, Pahoe Hoi, which is ropey lava. It looks like ropes as, as it's solidified. And this is called Aa -a lava. And I always like to think that uh, if you walk bar barefoot on it, you go, ah. It's very cindery lava, and it rips your tires. I mean, we, there were, I think we had, uh, there were six vehicles, and we had you know, sort of 10 punctures and whatever, just getting that 60 kilometers into the, uh, we got lost, by the way, in several times. <clears throat> okay, let's, um, how are we doing? Running out of time, no doubt. Um, thank you. Uh, right, very quickly, desert and climatic change. Mobile sand covers one third of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the Rubel Khali, which is down here, is twice the size of the British Isles and is the world's la largest sand desert. Um, you know, change the atmospheric pressure belts after the Ice Age, last Ice Age, caused the desiccation of Arabia. And all these fossil drainage patterns here are uh, from the tertiary, you know, 20 million years ago plus. <coughs> this is the Rubel Khali satellite image, um, false color, and these are uh, what we call sabkurs, which are salt flats, and these are the sand dunes here. Anything up to, some of these sand dunes are up to 500 meters high in the middle of the, here we are. Sand, sand, and more sand. My wife sitting on top of one of the sand dunes. Um, these are about 250 meters high. Yeah. These are ancient, these modern sand dunes here. Groundwater, and as the as the the groundwater rises, it solid the, the uh, or, sorry as the land surface um, descends uh, due to to uh, surface uh, depression, uh, the groundwater um, solidifies the, the, the rocks. These are uh, fossil ones here showing the, uh, the, the, the sand. Recent sea level changes in the Gulf of Arabia. Uh, during the Ice Age, sea level was down to 140 meters from what it is now. And this is dry land. The Euphrates and Tigris actually flowed out here into the, the Gulf of Oman. Right. So the sea level has changed rapidly as the result of the ice age, up and down, up and down. And as the, as the ice melted at the, after the end of the ice age, the waters you know, came back into the, into the Gulf. This is a raised beach here, um, about 100,000 years old when sea level was much uh, lower, so, so higher. Okay, I, I put this one in called Graffiti Rock near near Riyadh, um, dating back about six thousand, eight thousand years, showing um, ibex here, uh, various cattle, uh, wild dogs, uh, and humans hunting. Here's a uh, horned cattle. The, the, the predecessors of, of modern cattle. And these are um, arrowheads we found in, in one of, the, uh, in one of the, the, the sand dune areas. So 
8,000 years ago, there were all these animals living in what is now desert. I'm running out of time. So I think I will very quickly, the Arabian Shield, you got copper, it's very rich in copper and gold, iron ore, uh, there's construction materials and Arabian platform. Um, let me see, yeah. Uh, gold, yeah, it's, it's about no, um, nine producing gold mines, uh, copper, zinc, bauxite, phosphate. It's very rich, Marta Darb, uh, just very quickly. King Solomon's mine, probably King Solomon's mine. Um, certainly, uh, there's evidence they're mining a thousand years ago, and this is King Solomon time. It's, um, it's mined at the present moment, um, underground like this, but originally it was worked from the surface. These are uh, the old workings of 1000 BC. They're, sharp, they're narrow and very deep, you know, 20 meters or so deep, and obviously slaves have been working there. That's Mardi Dab, uh, King Solomon's mine, very probably. Uh, not Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's mine, which was in East Africa or Central Africa, but uh, uh, yeah, King Solomon's mine. Um, I ha do have more, but I think I'll leave it there because I run out of time. It's, uh, I've gone over time. But uh, anyway, um, thank you very much for your patience. I hope you've learned a little bit about Saudi Arabia. Um, well, just, just, just let me just, uh, excuse me. Okay. Oh, I must go back to, I'm sorry. I must go back to that one. That's my wife got holding a gold bar, um, which was, I can't remember how much it actually was, but it's, it's um, from a Doré bar, which is 50% which is gold. It's probably worth over $100,000. Shortly afterwards, someone tried to steal uh, gold ingots from the mine, um, so you're not allowed to visit. <laughs> we didn't, by the way. Okay, the end. Um, what was I going to say? Yes, it's a fantastic place. Um, and uh, one, one thing, of course, that um, um, I do have a little note I want to uh, to mention. Okay. I'm going to quote now. I'm finishing now, but uh, may I finish with this thought. Each time that you fill the tank of your car with fuel, you are con contributing to the sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia, known as the Public Investment Fund, controlled by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And, as you may know, the PIF is the major shareholder in Newcastle United Football Club. So perhaps there's good reason for me, for non-Newcastle supporters, to buy electric cars. <laughs> so I'll thank you for your patience. I have overrun as usual, but I hope you've learned something about Saudi Arabia and its geology. Thank you very much. Andrew Scott. Andrew Scott. Oh, right. One, two, three. <coughs> right. Here we are back again. Well, Dave, that was absolutely splendid. I actually feel as though I've been there on holiday <laughs> myself, even though I'm saying to go on holiday there wouldn't give you a, an inkling of what you've seen while you've been there, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and I enjoyed that very, very much indeed. So there we are. Um, are we, have we any questions? <laughs> I think you're all flabbergasted, aren't you? <laughs> yes, you, you've all heard so much, and I'm sure you'll think about it now and have, have a look a little bit further. Um, we do have, actually, Dave's um, volumes up in the library. Sorry. Oh, oh we, we have a question, Dave. We have a question. 
Uh, this is from Navia Dariga. In the current climate crisis, adding to diverse weather patterns in South Saudi Arabia. So is that could you repeat again? Let's see. Is the current climate crisis adding to diverse weather patterns in Saudi Arabia? Um, oh yeah, how, how can I put this? Um, yes, yeah. Saudi Arabia obviously it's a desert climate, but the central area is is desert. Uh, it does get rainfall. Um, rainfall is more prevalent, of course, on the Red Sea escarpment because you get the uh, monsoon from uh, the Indian Ocean impinging on the mountains and, and uh, uh, get torrential rainfall uh, at times. Um, the climate is changing. I think that we can say the climate is changing worldwide. <clears throat> um, when, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, we used to get uh, heavy rain a um, couple of times a year, uh, and you'd get devastating floods. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really know um, how the climate is changing, or how the global warming, for example, is, is actually changing the climate out there. I think it will make it more extreme. Uh, it's likely that the, uh, the, the, the wind pressure patterns will change, and uh, it's likely to be, become even more uh, desiccated, um, inland especially, uh, but I, I'm not quite sure how, it, how things will, will develop, except that probably won't get any better in terms of, of the climate. Thank you. Anyone else? No, 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 there we are. Well, um, let's see. Um, yes, uh, we've got to uh, give you a vote of thanks now, Dave, for the wonderful efforts you've put into uh, working out and making this, uh, making this uh, as interesting as it has been. So I wonder if I'd call on Norman Jackson uh, to give a vote of thanks. That talk was very different. I found it very fascinating. We've had a, a really a holiday show. We've had uh, our knowledge on tectonic plates uh, revised. We know all about the geology. And I think the, the big thing that's hit me is the standard of your illustrations. I think, if anything, they've been fantastic tonight. I've really, really enjoyed your talk. It's been interesting and it has been different. So on behalf of all present, present can I thank you for giving your time and preparing this excellent talk to us. Thank you. Can you show your appreciation to Norman? Thank you. Well, there we are. Well, absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, as Norman said, the, uh, the pictures were absolutely brilliant. So that leaves us uh, with... Um, well, it leaves us nowhere, actually, because uh, we don't know what the next lecture is going to be. Um, so if you keep your eye on the website for that, uh, no doubt uh, the information will come to you fairly quickly. Um, the only other thing I've got to say is, can you please remember to sign in the, uh, the documents up where, uh, where the doorway is there now to make sure, because we do get some little help from uh, the IMMM uh, for each member that, uh, or each person who signs on. Uh, incidentally, of which I don't know if uh, Andrew mentioned that earlier, but just remember that uh, if you want to further your career, uh, we are a part and uh, you know, tightly joined to the uh, IMMM, uh, who can give you uh, a lot of guidance and help and lead you to, uh, to whatever you wish to do as far as, uh, as education is concerned. So there we are. Thank you very, very much for turning up. Thank you for everybody on Zoom and on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you found it as interesting as I did, and, uh, and we all did. So thank you very much again for attending, and can you take great care on your way home tonight. Thank you, and I'll see you at the next meeting.